If you have your Bibles, uh, we'll continue worshiping the Lord through our time in the Word. We believe that worship, uh, we come and we sing and we make a joyful noise into the Lord. And we also believe that God communicates with us by His Spirit and through His Word, that He is not a silent God, but He speaks back to us through His Word. And so my hope and longing is that God will be pleased to use our time together to build this up. We're in Mark chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 18 through 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees uh, were fasting, and the people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and the worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, our King and our Lord, our Teacher and our Maker, we bow and we ask one simple thing, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word afresh and anew, and that by receiving it, that you would cause us to enjoy you more, that you would cause us to be those who not only hear your word, but do it, be those who make much of Christ. Would you change us, we pray, for the glory of your Son. In his name we pray, amen. So when I was growing up, I had the privilege of going to Davis Magnet School, uh, which was Davis Alternative School when I was growing up. And one of our former teachers is shaking her head because she remembers the school, Ms. Turner. But one of the things that I loved was our, our monthly assemblies. And so once a month, I'm guessing it was on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, the entire elementary school would gather in the assembly, and there would be some, something special going on. One of the assemblies that I remember the most was the day that uh, someone invited, I don't know if he was a zookeeper or somebody who, who had animals. And this guy comes in with all of his animals, and he shows them off to us. And then he kind of concludes his time, and he pulls out two snakes. And he held one snake in one hand, and the other snake in the other hand, and you know, I was probably third or fourth grade, and so I'm looking, and, and the, the, snake, the snakes were yellow, and they were red, and they were black, and he held them up. He says, hey, one of these snakes, if it bites you, it will probably kill you, and the other one, if you see it, you can go and pick it up, and so he got a friend of mine up to try to pick out the snake that he thought was safe, and he picked the wrong one. He was like, no, you would be dead, right? And so we laughed, but we were terrified, right? Because they, they looked alike. I mean, we were like third and fourth, fourth graders. And just, just this, this fear of if I'm out in the woods playing or riding my bike and I see this snake and he bites me. And so there was just this fear. And finally, he says, let me help you. And he gave us this little jingle. And he says, one of these is a, uh, a, a scarlet, uh, scarlet something. And the other one was a uh, king snake. One was a uh, scarlet coral snake, and one was a king snake. And he says, Here, here's a jingle. Red touch black, it's good for Jack. And he says, red touch yellow, it will kill a fellow. Right? And that was a jingle. He says, it's that simple. If you see red touching black, you're good. If you see red touching yellow, you need to run, right? But it's, I'm thinking through my th third grade, fourth grade year old self, in the midst of confusion, right? You're seeing these two things that look alike, and yet there was great panic and anxiety around not being able to identify uh, what was harmless or harmful. I think in the same way Jesus sort of walks into uh, Palestine or he walks into the Middle East, and I think people are, in some sense, they're confused. They're confused because they see religiosity, they see external things happening, they see praying, they see giving, 
They see worshiping in the temple, and they even see people fasting. And the people are somewhat confused because when they look at Jesus, Jesus' disciples are not fasting. And so they, they, they come to Jesus like, man, can, can you clear this up? Because we need to know what's true. We need to know what's real. We need to know what's dangerous. And, and, and Jesus, somewhat like that zookeeper, he says, it's okay, I got it. I'll simplify this for you. I have no desire to keep you in the darkness. My desire is to bring you into truth and to bring you into life. No need to panic. And one sense, I think that helps us to frame the passage that on the one hand, last week, Jesus' disciples were feasting, feasting in the house of a tax collector. And this week, the people see Jesus' disciples not fasting while other disciples are fasting, and they're confused. And they're like, Jesus, which one is it? Are we to be a feasting people? Are we to be a fasting people? Which one is it? And that's what Jesus is up against in our text. I want to look at it through four lenses or four frames. And the first thing I want us to really deal with is the confusion of the people. Once again, they see Jesus doing something that's, that, that's not in step with what they think is socially acceptable. And once again, right here, they're going to Jesus. Now, I want you to understand what's happening, that these people, they see the Pharisees and they see the disciples of the Pharisees fasting, right? They're abstaining from food. They're devoting them, themselves to prayer. They're denying the body, right? They're stretching the soul that they might meet with the Lord. And it's, and it's not just that the Pharisees and their disciples are fasting. You got John the Baptist and John the Baptist's disciples are also fasting. They're doing the same thing. And this is a big deal because they're enemies. John the, disciple, John the Baptist was a thorn in the flesh of the Pharisees, right? And so now you got two enemies, two enemies. Disciples are doing the same thing. And then they look at Jesus' disciples, and they're not fasting. And so they come to Jesus, and guess what? Jesus is, a sense, their rabbi, right? The disciples of the Pharisees. Mark is couching the Pharisees in the role of a, a rabbi, and he's also casting John the Baptist in the role of a rabbi, and every rabbi has followers. And so what these followers are doing, the presumption is they've learned this from their maker. And so the Pharisees have taught fasting, John the Baptist have taught fasting, and Jesus has not. And they take issue with Jesus. Like, wait a minute, we see them doing it and them doing it, but it looks like it's not important to you because you're the rabbi. Now, why? why? Why would that be a legitimate question? Because we know from Leviticus chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 16 that we think that there was probably one day where fasting was commanded in Scripture. And if you go back and read Leviticus 23, it says, afflict yourself. And then there's a number right there by it. And at the bottom of your Bible, it might say, and fast. And it, it's not just once in Leviticus 23, it's actually three times, afflict yourself and fast. And this was on the Day of Atonement. Now, what in the world is the Day of Atonement? It is the highest and holiest day in all of Israel. It is the one day when the high priest would go into the holies of holies. It is the one day where, where you would get these two goats that would come before the Lord and the, the, the high priest would cast a lot. And if the lot fell on a goat, that goat was sacrificed. And then the lot did not fall on the other goat. And that great high priest would confess the sins of Israel on the head of the goat and touch the goat. And he would send that goat out into the wilderness, communicating that on the one hand, your sins will be atoned for. And on the other hand, your sins will be carried away as far as the east is from the west. This was all on the highest and holiest day of the Lord, the day of atonement. That was the day that Israel they were commanded to afflict themselves and to fast and to do no work. And the Lord says, whoever does not do this will be cut off from Israel. So in the background, you know, in the backdrop of their minds, wait a minute, right? Fasting is important. But it's not just on this corporate day that if you read the Old Testament, that fasting is all over it, right? Right? 
David, in one of the Psalms, he says, my tears have been my food. Right? What about when David lost a child that he conceived with Bathsheba? He fasted. He wouldn't eat. What about Ezra? As he is coming with the exiles back into Jerusalem, he gets to the Ahava River and he calls a fast. He says, let us humble ourselves before our God. Let us fast. What about Nehemiah? Nehemiah is in Susa, the citadel, the fortified city, and then he hears about what's going on in Jerusalem. While he is up eating the king's meat, he hears about all the destruction in Jerusalem, and he, he starts to pray and he fasts. What about Esther? When Haman tries to, 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 to carry out this plot to wipe out all the Jews, what does Esther say? Esther says, go to Mordecai and let's fast, call a fast for all the Jews in Susa for three days. We will fast and seek the Lord. What about Jesus? That, it, that, that, that right before this, when Jesus is in the wilderness, he fasts not for, 30 day, not, not for three days, but for 40. 40 days fasting. And all of a sudden, when you read this passage, given Leviticus, given David, given Nehemiah, given Ezra, given what Jesus has just done himself, his disciples aren't fasting. You see the conundrum? We ought to at least feel the validity of the question. That whereas John the Baptist and the Pharisees in their rabbi handbook for discipleship had fasting at the beginning, right? Jesus, the true rabbi, shows up. It looks like it's not even in the script. And they're taking issue with it. Why aren't your disciples fasting, Jesus? The kingdom is causing confusion. Just like last week when he went into the house of a sinner and tax collector, why are you eating with them, Jesus, that he is breaking this mold? He said the kingdom is going to be deeper and better and broader than what you can imagine. We don't currently have categories for it. But what if Jesus could see what they couldn't see? And what if he knew what they didn't know? What if he, like the zookeeper, is privy to information that we, like fourth graders, don't get. And I think that makes way for our second point, that in the face of their confusion, you start to see the clarity of Jesus' sight, that they might not be able to see, but he sees. He knows what's going on. In Zach Eswine's book on preaching, He speaks of addressing the human condition in a passage. And when he writes about this human condition, the human condition in the passage, that it is the part of the passage that requires God's grace for us to glorify him and enjoy him more. And for some who are not in fellowship with the Lord, then what we need in that same passage is God's grace that we might properly regard him and be reconciled. So notice what he is saying. He's saying that even in this room right now, that as we deal with this this passage, that some of us are hearing and we're believers and our hearts are ripe and we want to obey. We see the Lord. We want to enjoy him and know him more and, and, and more fully. And at the same time, some listening right now don't know the Lord. And what you need not is to enjoy him more fully. You need to be reconciled and being reconciled, then learn, taught and exposed to how now to enjoy and glorify the God you're reconciled to. What he's talking about is the different ways that we need to think about Scripture. And he goes on to say that there is a difference between a person's fallen condition and a person's finite condition. Well, what's a fallen condition, Pastor L? It's the part of our identity that addresses our inner tendency towards temptation and evil and sin. That this can be caused by the hardness of heart, our warring desires, or or our sinful sin. But he says every expression of brokenness 
is not necessarily morally evil. Sometimes we need God's grace and provision because we're finite and we live within our own limits of knowledge, understanding, and emotional capacity. You hear what he's saying? That as we think about Scripture, that there are times when our finiteness, that God is up to something that we don't quite see or comprehend, and we need his grace to break in and expand that. And there are times when we read Scripture where it's our sin that the Scripture is addressing and we're morally wrong and God is calling us to repent and believe. What he's saying is it's both. Now, now why do I bring that up? Because I think there's a, this is a helpful frame to look at this passage. John the Baptist's disciples are fasting and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting. But are their fasts the same? Would you group John's disciples and say that their fasting is just like the Pharisees? You you probably couldn't look at Scripture and make that case, right? Here's what's going on. This is something unique to Mark. Mark actually says, look at verse 19. Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Mark is the only gospel writer who uses that emphasis, that they can't. As long as Jesus is here, you can't, you shouldn't. Fasting should be suspended. And therefore, what this means, that whether you're talking about the Pharisees who are fasting, it should not be happening Or you're talking about the disciples of John the Baptist because the bridegroom is here. Their fasting should not be happening. And I want to submit to you that their fasting is not coming from the same place. Well, what do we know about the fasting of the Pharisees? That it's ritualism. Jesus writes about it. He talks about it all over the Gospels. One example is in Luke chapter 18. Jesus and Jesus tells the parable. He tells the parable of two men who go to the temple. One is a Pharisee and one is a tax collector. This is the sight of Jesus, right? Two men go to the temple and pray. The Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. I give a tithe off of all that I get. And the other man, a tax collector standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He beat his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus poses the question, which of the two do you think went home justified? Was it the man who beat his chest or was it the man who boasted in his fasting and his tithe? Jesus says the man who went home justified was not the man who boasted in his fasting. What was the Pharisee doing in that parable? And Jesus wrote the parable. They're fasting. It was a means to commend themselves to God. I do this thing and I do this thing. And therefore, God, look at me. I have earned favor with you. And Jesus says, no, you haven't. They're turning something good into this thing that they do to commend them to God. And that's not the only time Jesus talks about it. He later says in Matthew 6, and do not fast like the hypocrites. They disfigured their faces that their fasting might be seen by others. He says, I tell you, they have received their reward. So not only are they commending themselves to God because they fast, but this fast sort of becomes this religious tool that helps them look down on others who aren't. This reputation heck, was, was so broad that a primary source in the first century, that Caesar, who was known to be a light eater, once boasted that on a particular lean day, he had fasted even more than the Pharisees. That's the reputation that this is a ritual, which is good, that it was rampantly misused. That what was good had become corrupted. What Jesus saw had so deviated from God's intent that he was concerned. He walked into a scene that looks just like the scene in Isaiah 58 where they're going through the motions. And God says, this is not the fast that I require of you. 
It's a source of, home, uh, of, of pride. Well, what about the disciples of John the Baptist? Look, if you study the rest of the Gospels, I actually think they had a sweet relationship with Jesus. Remember that time when John is in prison and he sends his disciples? Go ask Jesus. Go ask Jesus, are you really the one or should we expect another? And he, John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus and Jesus says, tell John what you see. And they go back and tell John. Who did they go to the moment John the Baptist was killed? It says they went back and they found Jesus. You ever thought about this? Jesus' own disciples. You know when they ask Jesus, teach us to pray? You know what they ask Jesus? Jesus, will you teach us to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray? And that's when Jesus taught them, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What prompted that prayer in your Bibles? It was when Jesus' own disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples to pray. And here is what Jesus draws the line. I know you see John and his disciples fasting, but I'm not going to teach you that right now. You feel that? You feel the weight of that? Jesus follows suit to teach them how to pray, but when it comes to fasting at this point in his ministry, he says, no, no, we're not going to follow John the Baptist's lead on this. Now, why? Turn to Matthew chapter 9, in Mark's gospel, the people come and say to Jesus, look at Matthew 9, 14. This is the same text. It's the same text. It's the same account, but notice how this starts. And then the disciples of John came to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? But turn back to Mark. Mark says the people are asking. And in Matthew, Matthew says the people doing the fasting are asking. In other words, in Matthew's gospel, John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus. Hey, we're confused, brother. Can you tell me why we're doing this again? Like, why? Why are we doing this and y'all are not? You you feel that? In other words, something about their fasting with Jesus being here is not right. What's going on? I think they're in a place just like they were earlier in their ministry. Remember that passage when John the Baptist's disciples were going after Jesus? and the crowds were following Jesus, what did John the Baptist's disciples say? John, why are all of those people following Jesus? And what did John the Baptist say? He must increase, and I must decrease. In other words, they didn't fully see They didn't understand that the losing of disciples to Jesus was actually the right thing to be happening. They didn't understand that John's discipleship and his ministry was preparing them to follow a greater person than John. And therefore, in their fasting, they don't see that their fasting itself is even supposed to be related to Jesus. This isn't sin, right? This is their finiteness that that Jesus has not yet broken in to give them the grace to connect this discipline back to him. You see it? They're finite and they're learning. And this is what Jesus sees, that both groups are fasting, but it's coming from a different place, that, that, that one group is known for misuse and the other group is known for misunderstanding And he says, look, I'm going to clear it up. You both are wrong. 
You both are wrong. Haven't you kind of been there where they are? Can, can we kind of relate to like right where they are? That these physical disciplines, these spiritual disciplines, who cannot say that there have been times in my life where I'm like the Pharisee. I boast and beat my chest because I think I'm better than somebody because I do this thing. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I serve. I do this. And therefore, inside of our hearts, we actually think we're commending something to God. And who hasn't been on the other side of the spectrum? Because granny told me to go to church. I'm going to go to church because I know I'm supposed to be here. But the dots have not yet been connected to Jesus. And here's the thing. Jesus has grace for both. Whether you're in sin and it's your pride and you're misusing grace, or if in your ignorance God has not yet showed up and pointed everything we do back to him, guess what? He says, it's okay. I can fix this. I can cover this. I can redeem this. And the third thing you see is the cross that rescues and reorients. Jesus inaugurates a break in what was going on around him. He would not let the fasting of the Pharisees creep into his disciples, and nor would he allow the fasting of John's disciples to creep into his disciples. He's condemning one, and he wants to connect the other. And he does it through these parables. And so look at verse 19. He says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Jesus is saying that my presence kicks off a time to feast. Look, I'm a pastor, and I've had the privilege of doing a lot of weddings. I've married two people who were white, officiated that service. I've officiated weddings where both people were black. I've officiated weddings where it's interracial. I even got to do a Nigerian wedding a few months ago. And they gets down, right? (laughs) I'm going to be really honest, right? It blew my mind. Here is what I've never seen. I've never walked into a wedding regardless of how much money you spend on it, regardless of who's walking down the aisle, I've never walked into a reception that felt like a funeral. There is good food, and there is dancing, and there is feasting, and there is joy, and that is the image that Jesus uses. He said, can you fast when the bridegroom is here? Can you fast at a wedding? Absolutely not. And if we think our weddings have anything or what Jesus would have been talking about, them jokers, they party for seven days in a row. It was not three or four hours. It was seven days long. And you had to set it out. You remember Jesus' first miracle? He turns water into wine at a wedding. And they had already went through all the wine. And Jesus gives them the best wine ever. It was at a wedding. Here's a few photos. Will you get these for me, Greg? This is a Jew. I I put these up there. These are Jewish weddings, right? You see the men have their yarmulkes on, but look at this dude. He is breakdancing. This is at a wedding. Next slide. This dude, oh, yeah. (laughs) I see you, Jimmy. (laughs) Well, technically, hey, that's not me, but y'all get the point. My dude right there is crowd surfing at a Jewish wedding, right? Next slide. Look at this. This is at a wedding. This is a Jewish wedding. Next slide. Look at this. Bay is up there too. The, the bride is getting in on the action. Now, here's the question. Do you see people fasting and frowning and mourning there? Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Greg. You got me. Good one. <laughs> Come on, like, talk to me. Do you, it's, it's inappropriate. And you know what Jesus says? Your groom is here. And everything you're fasting points to is here. That if you're sad over your sin, well, guess what? Your husband is here to redeem you. Why be sad? 
If you're worried about being in the presence of the Lord and drawing near, how much closer can you get than your Savior is right next to you? Why do you fast? And here's the thing. We are more than simply attendants at the wedding. If you understand Isaiah, our call to worship, we are actually the bride. And if the wedding attendants are excited and joyful, how much more is the bride? Because her boo is right in front of her. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm here. I'm right here with you. I've come to redeem you. Your sins will not separate you from me. If you ever doubt how much you are loved by your maker, he took on flesh and he humbled himself and became a servant and he walked in Palestine. He walked in the Middle East for three years and he lived and he prayed and he laughed. He showed up. If you would ever doubt that God will not draw near, Jesus says, doubt no more. And so that's why he says they can't fast. Everything that fasting points to is right here in front of them. And you know what Peter says? He actually says it in 1 Peter chapter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and you're filled with glory. You're obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls concerning this salvation. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to come, it was revealed to them that they were serving not just themselves, but you. In other words, when you and I pick this up, it is not just truth that was true for them. The writers of Scripture are serving you and I. And therefore, Jesus says the Christian life is a life of joy, of joy and feasting, of joy and celebration, of joy and deep gladness. And yet... Did you notice what verse 20 says? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Did you catch that? First he says they cannot. You cannot fast with me here. And then he says you will fast. The wedding gets interrupted. That's what Jesus is saying. This wedding, these celebrations, this joy that you saw in those photos, that wedding gets interrupted. It was normative for the the, the bridal party and the guests to leave while the bride and groom stayed. And Jesus flips that and says, no, no, no. The bridal party is not leaving. I'm leaving. That somebody's going to come in here right during the wedding and somebody's going to haul me off. And that joy that you feel with the coming of your Savior and King, in a moment, the bottom is going to fall out of your life. You hear what he's saying? Remember I told you at the beginning of Mark, I think Mark is shaped by Isaiah. That Isaiah gives us this language in Isaiah 62 of this bridegroom. But if you go back nine chapters, Isaiah also introduces the suffering servant. And you know what he says about the suffering servant? He is born our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray, each of us in our own ways. And God has laid our iniquity upon him. By oppression and judgment, He was taken away and cut off from the land of the living. You see that phrase? He was taken away. It's the same phrase right there in verse 20. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. And so what Isaiah is saying is your bride and your groom, your bride is is Jesus, but your groom is also a suffering servant. 
And he is not hauled off because someone is evil. He is hauled off because his bride is unfaithful. He is hauled off because we're unfaithful. And the wages of our unfaithfulness is death. Death of the groom killed by his bride because of his bride's waywardness. They experience the height of the heights in his joy. And we contribute to the lowest of the lows in our sin where our own maker was put on a cross because we're unfaithful. And Jesus says that on that day, they will grieve. They will grieve. I tried to look for a clever illustration about a a bride who lost her husband early on. And I'll be honest with you, that is my wife's story. That her mother married her high school sweetheart. They went to college and got married, had one daughter, and then had my daughter, had my wife. And when my wife was two, her dad died in a car accident. And her mother has been widowed for 37 years, never remarried. And I've asked her, I'm like, Mom, like, why? She said, I've never loved a man like him. Right? You walk into her house, his photos are still on all the walls. There's this low-grade grief. That, that she carries, that we get cards in the mail, and it's still signed, your mom and your dad. You feel that? And here's the thing, Christian, that's our story. Our story is that we have lost a husband. Our maker and our king and our savior was taken away because we are guilty. And we should go all through life with this low grade, I did that. With this low grade, he was crucified for me. With this low grade, man, it was my sins that put him on the cross. You see what Jesus is saying? There is immense joy in the Christian life. And there's also grief. Grief over our sin. Grief over longing to see our Savior face to face. That those two things, that that is the new way forward as a believer. That they're intermixed right now for a season. And there is coming a day when there is no more grief and no more sadness and no more sin. But as long as we are on this earth, it hurts. It hurts. It, our hearts ache. And we did that. And we long to see him. This is a home. And so the Christian life, it is this beautiful, beautiful sense of joy. Like my sins have been atoned for. I'm righteous. I don't care what happens to me. Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. And we can feast around that. But I'm not right. And my sin still rears its ugly head. And it causes us grief. That there is coming a day when we won't fast. We will see him. There is coming a day where it will truly be consummated and we will be with him. But until then, we're limping through life, feasting and fasting at the same time. And that's the new way forward, right? That is the new and common way forward that our lives, we will fast. And we will be people who feast. It will be both. And it's not going to be set by a clock. It is not by the day of atonement. And you don't need people to tell you when to do it. The Spirit of God is in you and your heart should ache for glory. 
And when it aches and when you feel this world pressing in and your heart is divided, the Lord says, just withdraw, draw near to me. You shall not live by bread, but, but bread that comes from me. That we do that in the midst of hardship, we can draw near to our God and abstain from sex and abstain from alcohol and abstain from watching television and abstain from meals that we can actually give up these creature comforts because God wants to fill us anew with himself. And then we can come out of that and throw a lavish feast and enjoy his grace and mercy towards us in Christ. That that is the rhythm now until we get home. Until we get home. That that's the new way forward. We feast and we fast. Let's pray. Father, we give our time to you and pray that you would, by your spirit, call us out of making this earth our home. Call us by your spirit to give up certain things that we might draw near to you. Call us in the midst of this place to feast and to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Father, this new way forward cannot match with what was old. This new way forward is a way of the Spirit where we walk in the Spirit and your Spirit will lead us when it's time to feast and your Spirit will lead us when it's time to fast. We pray that you would do this for the glory of Christ. Amen.